Thank you, Secretary Kerry, for coming today. Um, you mentioned in your remarks that we don't uh, need politicians to go home and say we need to end foreign aid and we need to spend some of that money at home. Well, this might come as news to one of the most prominent politicians in our country who said in his reelection campaign that we need to do less nation building abroad and more nation building at home, and that would be your current boss, the President of the United States. So I don't think this is unique to Republicans or Democrats. In fact, it crosses all party lines. It's not me going home and creating an atmosphere where people are doubtful of foreign aid. It's that 80 to 90 percent of people are doubtful. We have two bridges in my state that are over 50 years old. The president came, and I flew down with him to talk about rebuilding them. I'm in favor of replacing bridges and rebuilding our infrastructure. But at the same time, we seem to not have enough money to keep the doors open around here, not enough money to keep the touring of the White House open. This administration sent an extra $250 million to... Egypt. Many of us find that offensive. We can't even run the basic functions of government, and yet we send an extra $250 million in addition to the $2 billion we already send over there. So many of us are offended by this. What que the question I have for you is, the Mubarak family is said to be worth more than $10 billion. Most people say that a lot of that money came from our foreign aid. Mobutu ruled for many, many years in Central Africa. He was said to be worth millions upon millions, if not billions of dollars. His wife was called Gucci Mobutu. She was famous for going to Paris and shopping for shoes with a Louis Vuitton bag full of $500,000 in cash to a million dollars in cash. That money was looted from the American Treasury. There is all kinds of examples of theft and kleptocracy. There's examples of our foreign aid being used to buy tear gas in Egypt and used to spray on the Egyptian people. So I don't think it even buys the goodwill of the people because often it's stolen by their leaders who are unpopular in their country. So I think it's often counterproductive. But I think we're missing the boat here if you think that we're stoking the fires and that the people don't already believe this. This is something that is already in the psyche of the people. People are upset about it, would rather spend money at home. but. Um, I'd like your comments on the president's position, but also on the the idea of that a lot of foreign aid has been stolen by these leaders. Well, Senator, uh, I think there's a difference between you know some of the nation building that we've seen sometimes engaged in and good foreign aid programs that don't rise to the level necessarily of, of, of sort of nation building. But that's a quibbling, probably, and we'll wind up arguing about the smaller issue rather than the larger one here. So uh, let, me, let me try to frame it this way. Has some money been stolen? Absolutely. Uh, but by the largest measure possible today, because of reforms that have been put in place, because of new accountability systems, because of the way aid is given now, because of uh, uh, so something like the Millennium Challenge Corporation standards that are applied to uh, uh, investment and other kinds of things, the money, a lot of it doesn't go to governments anymore directly. It goes into either the investment or into the project, and it's quite controlled. And that's one of the reforms that has been put into place. Um, so, and we often have a fight about that with some countries. For instance, uh, you know, Pakistan pushed very, very hard to say, no, we want it directly to the government. And we said, no, we're going to do it this way to project and so forth in order to have the kind of accountability that you're talking about that we need. So historically, yeah, uh, but, you know, some of the riches of people who have ripped off their own governments have not necessarily come from our aid. They've come from stealing from the revenues of their oil or selling the diamonds and the rubies that they have in their re resource-rich uh, you know, mines. And, and, and there are plenty of ways that people have enriched themselves in some countries to the adversity of their people. That's something we fight. I mean, that is also part of what our foreign policy and investments try to change, is installing rule of law is trying to help with the justice system, create accountability for those things. But nevertheless, we kept sending money to Mobutu for well, years and Mubarak for well, years despite know. evidence I, that they were stealing it. I, 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 I didn't make that decision, and, and 
I'll certainly review any program that we're engaged in now, and if you have any information about something we're doing now that somebody's stealing, let me know immediately. But let me just come back to one thing about this. You know, all of this that we do, Senator Paul, is one penny on the dollar. And if you look, I mean, I can go through a long list of things that we invest in that provide a return on our investment. I'll give you an example. We have stopped countless plots against our country, which had the FBI not cooperated and had the CIA and other entities not been creating some of the programs we had, and had we not worked with the justice systems and had Interpol and the other things that we work with, we never would have done. Americans would have died and they would have been blown up. And but for the discovery of the Christmas bomber or the other people which came through these kinds of efforts, uh, we made our country safer. That's a damn lie and you know it! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Can the federal government take credit for saving us from a plot of its own creation? Tonight, has the federal government kept us safe or does it just want us to think that it has kept us safe? Since the tragedy of 9-11, numerous crazies and low-level copycats have engaged in criminal behavior which they hoped would result in the deaths, the deaths of innocent Americans and somehow advance their cause of jihad. If you ask the leadership of the FBI, most of whose field agents are tireless, dedicated, constitution-supporting professionals, it will tell you that it, the FBI, has foiled about 17 plots to kill Americans during the past 10 years. What it will not tell you is that there have been 20 foiled plots and of them, three were interrupted by members of the public. The 17 that were interrupted by the feds were created by the feds. We all remember the three that were foiled by diligent Americans, the shoe bomber, the underwear bomber, and the Times Square bomber. In all of these cases, the crimes charged were those of attempting to kill and conspiring with others to do so. In all three of those cases, alert Americans on transcontinental flights or in the streets of New York City told authorities of bizarre behavior or actually subdued the threats themselves. There was no foiling by the FBI. The plotters were, thankfully, bumbling fools who had poorly planned their criminal behavior and who ended up harming no one. All three are serving life terms. But the more curious cases are the remaining 17 for which the federal government has taken credit. They all have a common and reprehensible thread. They were planned, plotted, controlled, and carried out by the federal government itself. In all of these 17 cases, from the Fort Dix 6 to the Lackawanna 7 to the Portland Parade Bomber, the feds found young men of Muslim backgrounds, loners who were bitter at America. They befriended them, cajoled them, and persuaded them that they could change the world by killing Americans. In all these cases, agents worked undercover and portrayed themselves to the targets as Arabs of like un-American mind. In some cases, the federal agents used third parties to act as middlemen. The third parties were typically persons who had been convicted of crimes and who, in return for leniency at their own sentencings, were willing to work with the same feds who prosecuted them in order to help the feds and trap whomever else those feds were pursuing. Thus, in all 17 of these cases, because of the command and control of federal agents. No one was ever in danger. No one was harmed. No bomb went off and no property was damaged. But in all those cases, the losers whom the feds targeted each believed that they were interacting with real plotters who would bring them cash and bombs. As we know, sometimes the cash arrived, but the bombs never did. The defendants were essentially charged and convicted for playing a game with federal agents. The most recent of those gener uh, government-generated plots was revealed yesterday. It has a new twist because it allegedly involves agents of the intelligence apparatus of the government of Iran. It, too, was destined to go nowhere as the feds monitored and taped every move made by their target as he interacted with federal agents whom he stupidly believed to be drug dealers and co-conspirators. Today, the feds themselves revealed that high officials of Iran's government knew nothing of this. Of course, the neocons have demanded bombs on Tehran, no matter what the government there knew. And this plot came to light the day before Attorney General Holder himself was subpoenaed by Congress in the Fast and Furious case. You get the picture. Are any of these plots criminal? Can the government just pick and choose whom to seduce and then lower the boom at the right time and arrest its would-be Confederates? Is this a proper and efficient use of law enforcement resources? The answers to these questions are obvious and they are not good. 
The courts have made this legal so long as the target of these plots had a mental predisposition to cause harm. But none of this keeps us safe. All of this makes us less free, as any one of us can be entrapped. And we are fools if we praise the government for exposing a plot of its own creation and saving us from a danger that never existed. Can the government break the law in order to enforce it? Well, when it does, it becomes a law unto itself, and the rule of law dies as the feds decide whom to target and whom to trap. Think about it. Are we really safe in a false sense of security? Why do we pay the government to trick us into believing it is keeping us safe? When no one is harmed and the government controls the plot, aren't we just punishing someone for his thoughts? And in a free society, aren't free people free to think as they wish? This must be so, because if the government can punish our thoughts, there are no limits to its power. From New York, defending freedom. So I, I have to tell you, for the penny on the dollar, I'll still make this argument anywhere, even though, yes, occasionally, something gets abused. Just as it gets abused in some parts of uh, almost every government. Okay, that's it. I'm calling bullshit. One quick question. Uh, yesterday, the chairman of Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, stated that he was no longer sure that the United States could clearly identify the right people in Syria. I'm quite concerned with this and quite concerned about arming uh, elements of radical jihad that ultimately will uh, come back to be our enemies or enemies of Israel. Um, my question is, is that there's a, you know, there's a million Christians in Syria. I don't, I don't think they've quite decided which side they're on. Uh, 250,000 of those Christians came from Iraq because they weren't too happy with the government that's been installed in Iraq after we win the war. So uh, the question is, you know, you win the war and radical Islam takes over in Syria or you give weapons to these groups, you have your own joint chief of staff saying he's not sure he knows who the right guys are and who to arm. I, I really think we ought to be uh, careful about getting involved in the civil war. Well, uh, Senator, your, your warning is a, is a legitimate one, and, and we are being careful, which is why the president has not yet decided whether or not to uh, which is why the president has not given lethal aid. He has given non-lethal aid. Uh, but the president is correct, I believe, in, uh, in his determination that President Assad can no longer represent the people of uh, that country and that the Syrian opposition is the broad-based uh, international entity that is representative of the real aspirations of the Syrian people. Now, that's a different determination from actually deciding you can protect who's getting what. Uh, I've had conversations with General Dempsey, obviously, and I read his quote. And I saw what he said. I think he really said, we're not certain we can do that yet, but we have to make certain or we have to be sure. And that's exactly what we do have to do, and that's exactly what we're engaged in. That's why I have this meeting that I'm going to in uh, Istanbul on the weekend. Uh, and a lot of discussion is taking place to be certain of that determination. I think what he's really saying is be sure before you make the decision, and he's right, and that's what we're trying to do. Thank you.